by yourself, name, affiliation, uh, et cetera. That's the first announcement. The second announcement is that this is a panel for which continuing legal education credit is available. And if you were to be properly credited for your CLE time in minutes and hours, you're uh, required to have checked in your badge by having it scanned at the time that you entered the room. And then you also have to check out by scanning your badge when you leave the room. And so, um, if you didn't check in, well, that's probably too bad. Um, but when you are leaving, if you did check in, please remember to check out. So those were the uh, administrative announcements. And now I'd like to begin the program. So um, I'm Lori Damrosh. I'm the president-elect of the American Society of International Law. And unfortunately, I have no actual powers as of now. So I cannot be a sovereign lawgiver. I've just had to cajole this panel to follow my collegial suggestions. Um, but this panel is scheduled in what the uh, annual meeting typically calls the late-breaking event, or the hot topic. And those of you who've been going to these meetings for a while will remember that somehow there's always some late-breaking event that happens. Like 30 years ago, Nicaragua filed a lawsuit against the United States on Monday, and we convened on Wednesday, and that was a late-breaking event. Or sometimes the late-breaking event is a humanitarian tragedy, of which there have been a few too many uh, crises that are in progress with uh, mass atrocities going on. Um, and sometimes, we have a late-breaking event that seems like it might actually even be paradigm-shattering, something that's going to change the landscape of the world as we know it or change the landscape of international law. So three years ago, we were in the midst of the Arab Spring, and it really wasn't clear when we convened uh, in mid-spring how those developments um, would play out either in uh, on the ground terms or in their Im implications for uh, the various doctrines of international law or even the processes and uh, discourse of international law. So, uh, so we're in this series of uh, late breaking event panels and I was going to try out some little Russian phrase like all annual meeting panels are like happy families. <laughs> they all, I don't know, they all have a moderator and four speakers, um, <laughs> and we're a happy family here, but the late-breaking event panels are all late-breaking in their own way, and what we want to figure out is whether this late-breaking event is one of the paradigm-shattering events. Um, I'm reminded of my own track record as a professor of international law. Uh, one day I started teaching international law, and it was the first time I was teaching the course from beginning to end, and it was January 15th, 1991, and war broke out on the day of class. And you sort of have to think, well, what am I going to do with my international law syllabus? Or then um, the next year, you know, what could top that? War breaking out on the first day of class? The next year, the only thing that happened was that the Soviet Union had disappeared. Um, a few weeks before, uh, in between the time that the students had taken their exams in December and the time that we came back for January classes. And so you have to ask about a geopolitical event like that, whether the world of international law is the same after that event. Is it just that we have 15 uh, states in place of one, or do we have some radically different understanding of international law? So I think we are asking those questions at this panel uh, some of you who are teachers of international law are going to go back on Monday or maybe even tomorrow and you'll be teaching your classes. And I'm not sure where you are in your syllabus. Uh, maybe Monday's the day that you're going to be covering self-determination or maybe it's the use of force or maybe it's acquisition of territory or human rights or nationality. Whatever you are going to teach on Monday is probably involved in some way um, in the issues that we are going to talk about today. Now, our program organizers, when they convened the late-breaking event, put together a series of questions. You have them in your program booklet. Uh, there are about a half a dozen questions altogether. Um, first, is the UN Charter's collective security system powerless in the face of the determined action of a member of the P5? Second, do European Union and US economic sanctions offer an effective alternative response to what many consider to be Russia's illegal actions in Crimea? 
Third, what role does international law's commitment to self-determination play in evaluating the lawfulness of the secession of Crimea and its annexation by Russia in the wake of a popular referendum? Fourth, does the claim that a democratically elected, though deposed, head of state of Ukraine issued an invitation to Russia offer any legal justification for the military intervention? Fifth, do claims that intervention was necessary for the defense of nationals carry any weight? And sixth, how should we evaluate President Vladimir Putin's reference to events in Kosovo, Iraq, and Libya as precedents for Russia's actions in Crimea? So um, I put those half dozen questions to our panelists. I asked them to each select uh, one or two of those that they would like to focus on. Uh, we've got some questions in that list that are very much about the normative universe of international law. What are the rules and the content of the rules? We have other questions that are about effectiveness and enforcement. And then we have other questions that are really about the whole system and discourse of international law, how we make arguments in international law, um, and so forth. Now, fortunately, I don't have to answer any of those questions. Um, we have four experts who will be approaching them from very diverse points of view. And my modest role will be uh, to moderate the discussion that follows. So our first speaker to my right is Simon Chesterman. He is the Dean of the National University of Singapore, Faculty of Law. He is the editor of the Asian Journal of International Law. He's the Secretary General of the Asian Society of International Law. He has taught at various universities. He has much UN experience. He's the author or editor or co-editor of about a dozen books. Uh, one of them on the law and practice of the United Nations with Thomas Frank and David Malone, uh, certainly relevant to our topic today. And then uh, his wonderfully titled book, You the People, I think probably has also something to do uh, with our topic. And he said that he's going to address those first two questions on the list that I put to you. Our second speaker is Professor Anatoly Kapustin. He's to my left. Um, I want to welcome him in particular. I, I welcome him on behalf of the American Society of International Law because he comes uh, here in his International Law Association capacity as the president of the Russian branch of the ILA. Uh, he was elected president of the Russian branch in 2008 and re-elected last year. And he's also a member of the executive council of the ILA in London uh, from 2008. He's the dean. No, he was the dean. He was the dean from 1995 to 2010 of the Faculty of Law and Professor of the Department of International Law at the People's Friendship University in Moscow um, and Head of the Department of International Law from 2000 to uh, 2010. And he is now the Vice Director of the Institute of Legislation and Comparative Law Research under the Government of the Russian Federation. Um, Professor Kapustin and I had some correspondence about the questions. And in our initial round of um, questions, he did something that would be very understandable to do, which would just be to say, you guys are asking the wrong questions, or you're asking questions that are biased in uh, the very way that they're being presented. So he formulated a somewhat different set of questions, uh, which I imagine we will get to in the question period. Uh, but then he has um, uh, offered the following uh, question, which he will focus on first, which is the problem of international legality of an unconstitutional coup d'etat. And the other question is from the original list. Uh, what role does international law's commitment to self-determination play in evaluating the lawfulness of the secession of Crimea and its annexation by Russia in the wake of a popular referendum? Our third speaker will be Dr. Nina Khrushcheva. She is an um, Associate Professor of International Affairs at the uh, Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy at the New School for Public Engagement. Um, she's also a Senior Fellow of the World Policy Institute in New York City. She holds the PhD from Princeton University. She has had a two-year research appointment at the School of Historical Studies of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She has served as deputy editor of the East European Constitutional Review at uh, NYU School of Law. And most recently, and perhaps quite uh, pertinent to today's topic, she is uh, publishing this year in uh, 2014 a book called uh, The Lost Khrushchev, A Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind. And for those of you who've been following the blogs or looking at um, 
posts. Um, I happen to Google one of her writings, um, a special to CNN, um, which goes by the name, Why Putin is Wrong to Blame My Great-Grandfather Khrushchev. So she will be uh, offering remarks not from inside the discipline of international law, but as a historian and political scientist looking at international law through the lenses of those disciplines and asking about the role of international law in uh, international politics. Now, our fourth and final speaker is <coughs> excuse me, Peter Olson. Your program tells you that he is the former NATO legal advisor, and indeed um, he was the legal advisor and director of legal affairs at NATO headquarters in Brussels uh, for a four-year period that began in February of 2010 and ended in February of this year. Um, as the principal legal counselor to the Secretary General and a key advisor to the North Atlantic Council, he provided legal support on the full range of policy, operational, and institutional matters addressed at NATO headquarters, including on NATO's 2011 military operation in Libya in implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1973. Uh, before joining NATO, Mr. Olson served in a series of senior legal positions in the Department of State, as well as in overseas assignments with USAID in Africa. And I can also tell you, he even served in junior positions in the Department of State because he and I started at the same time. And he rose to very high levels uh, in the department. And I left uh, much before. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, having introduced our speakers, I will just say, uh, why am I moderating this panel? I think this is some sort of trial by fire for me to become um, tomorrow your president. And maybe somebody knew that uh, a long time ago I majored in Russian and East European studies, and maybe somebody knew that among my ASIL activities, from 1989 until 1995, I co-directed a project with scholars from the former Soviet Union, and then in particular from the Russian Federation, and we published a couple of books, and one of those books was called Law and Force in the New International Order, published in 1991 with a chapter on intervention by invitation. And maybe that will be somehow relevant, but I won't be speaking. So I have laid down the law to these panelists. They each will have eight minutes to address their one or two questions. And I told them that I would enforce this eight-minute rule rigorously. And Professor Chesterman said, no, 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 you must enforce it ruthlessly. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, it's not my personality. I will be equipped with all the techniques of enforcement known in our discipline to make my commands effective. And I will begin with shaming sanctions at exactly the eight minute mark. And if the speaker then goes on to eight minutes and 30 seconds, then I have other coercive techniques. Um, there is a painting in the Museum of Modern Art by Vasily Kandinsky, and it is called Soft Pressure. And that's what I will exert at minute. 8.5, so Professor Chesterman. All right, thank you very much. Without wanting to take up time, um, as Laurie mentioned, I'm, uh, among other things, Secretary General of the Asian Society of International Law, and I bring greetings from the President of the Asian Society, Saraki Tsirithai. If you're interested in finding out more about the Asian Society, there's a meeting at the ungodly hour of 7 a.m. on Friday morning, but I can assure you that the Asian Society of International Law respects the human right to coffee, uh, and so you will have coffee if you come. So two weeks ago, Crimea literally changed the time. The clocks moved two hours forward to match the time in Moscow. Um, two weeks ago, there was what appeared to be semi-serious discussion about the uh, purported annexation of Crimea being reversed. But given what's happening now in eastern Ukraine uh, with Russian troops on the border, uh, it appears that if Russia um, satisfies itself with only Crimea, uh, there will be a collective sigh of relief uh, and life will go on. There will be eventually another reset of relations, and as I said, life will go on. So as Laurie mentioned, um, I'm tasked with asking or answering the first two questions, but because I think I can do it briefly, I'm going to try and answer a third, which is the last question. So the first question, is the UN Charter's collective security system powerless in the face of determined action of a member of the P5? Yes. Do EU and US economic sanctions offer an, e an effective alternative response to what many may consider Russia's illegal actions in Crimea? No. 
How should we evaluate President Vladimir Putin's reference to events in Kosovo, Iraq, and elsewhere as precedents, skeptically, but with some contrition? Um, so I'll go very briefly through the first two questions and then a little bit about the third. So is the UN collective security system powerless against a member of the P5? Well, of course it is. That's how it was designed, and that's how the Permanent Five, especially the United States, like it. Uh, and so it's disingenuous to suggest otherwise. That said, it has been fascinating over the past few weeks to see how Russia has tried to invoke various legal arguments with differing degrees of success, usually not much success. So reference to intervention by invitation, although uh, former President Yanukovych now says that even though he claims to have issued an invitation after being deposed, he now regrets it and would like to withdraw it. Uh, there's been reference to self-determination, not much reference to self-determination on part of the uh, Crimean Tatars, however. Humanitarian intervention, protection of nationals against nationals abroad, although not much evidence of what they needed to be protected from, um, and fascinating arguments about historic claims to territory. So there have been various efforts on the part of uh, Russia in general, President Putin in particular, to justify uh, the action, which is interesting because there could have been a simple brutal power play, but that isn't what happened. Western states, for their part, and commentators, have been overblown sometimes in their criticism with reference to aggression, which is arguable, um, and uh, criticism of the vote itself as being a violation of international law. Although I think one of the things we can take away from the Kosovo advisory opinion is that declarations of independence themselves may not necessarily uh, violate international law. They might violate domestic law, but not international law. And that was something that President Putin seemed to take great delight in quoting the United States' written submissions to the Kosovo advisory opinion in a speech he gave uh, some weeks ago. In any case, however, I think it's fairly clear that Russia's actions in Crimea violated Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter as a prohibition on the threat or use of force. What can be done? Well, Russia has already vetoed a Security Council resolution that 13 states supported. Interestingly, China abstained. Russia has always already also made it fairly clear that it will ignore the General Assembly resolution that was adopted on the 27th of March, despite 100 countries voting in favour of it. So what about sanctions? Well, these have limited capacity to influence Russia. President Obama, I think, has rightly said that uh, military force is not really on the table at the moment. Uh, although, interestingly, in speeches recently uh, concerning NATO, he's made it clear that the Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, as members of NATO, fall under the NATO umbrella. So if military action were to be taken against them, that would be regarded as a direct attack on the United States. But in terms of other measures, short of the use of force, Sanctions run the risk of cutting off one's nose to spite one's face. Uh, within Europe in particular, there is considerable anxiety about any kind of pot potential sanctions. Uh, financial sanctions would hurt Britain in particular, which has profited a lot from Russian investments, <coughs> leading to uh, London sometimes being called London Grad, given the dependence on, uh, on Russian investment. If military sales were targeted, France would be unhappy. unhappy. Uh, and if you really wanted to hurt Russia, you would cut off energy imports from Russia, but that would significantly hurt Germany and Italy, among others, uh, in the short term. President Obama eventually declared sanctions against 11 travel sanctions, among other things, against uh, 11 Ukrainian and Russian officials. In a tit-for-tat move, Russia very quickly had declared travel bans on 11 US officials, leading Senator John McCain to declare that he guessed that his uh, summer break in uh, Siberia was going to be off for the year. The EU has subsequently published a list of 21 individuals for targeted sanctions. There are some discussions of uh, expanding these sanctions, but no one really wants to hurt the fragile global economic recovery. It's possible that these sanctions will impose some pressure on Vladimir Putin through the network of people whose, uh, whose support he depends on in Russia, uh, but at the moment that seems unlikely, again, in the short term, because he is extremely popular within Russia. One, uh, one apparently genuine opinion poll rated him at 82% popularity. This might wane, however, uh, with the other symbolic sanctions, such as the March 24 expulsion, effective expulsion of Russia from what was then the G8, uh, and also the broader effect on the reputation of Russia, which had recently invested some $51 billion in the Sochi Winter Olympics, more than had been spent on all of the previous Winter Olympics combined, um, with an effort to uh, bring Russia out into the modern world, uh, demonstrating its status as a new and modern country. Much of that's now up in smoke. So how should we evaluate the way in which President Putin in particular has cited Kosovo and Iraq? Well, among other things, it's made it a lot harder to criticize him. When Secretary of State John Kerry 
states that Russia is behaving in a 19th century fashion by invading another country on completely trumped up pretexts, uh, it's very easy to counter that with the uh, accusation that he voted in favor of a war in Iraq, which we now know was on pretexts that, we that we were subsequently revealed to have been trumped up. Russia, for its part, preferred to cite the 1999 invasion of Kosovo, uh, which is no less awkward for the United States, which at the time bypassed the UN against Russian opposition to liberate an ethnically distinct region from a country that was considered hostile. At the time, the United States and others desperately tried to argue that Kosovo was sui generis, which was essentially interpreted as meaning shorthand for something that the United States could do and NATO could do that other, that other countries could not do. Uh, that argument never made much sense in legal terms. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, President Putin took some pleasure in quoting from US arguments uh, that had, presented, had been uh, presented in the Kosovo advisory opinion. All that said, the comparison is, of course, strained. Kiev's rule was nothing like as brutal as Belgrade's. The US was not seeking to acquire the territory for itself. And Kosovo's subsequent independence came after almost a decade of transitional administration under the UN. Russia has, however, invoked these arguments before with some degree of success. It was during another Olympics, the 2008 Summer Games in, in Beijing, that Russia liberated South Ossetia and Abkhazia from Georgia. Uh, virtually no states recognized those uh, liberations either, uh, but after muted criticism, there was a reset in relations and life went on. So how should we understand Crimea? First, and I'm sure my colleagues on the panel will uh, offer more on this, uh, it's important to understand this not simply from the perspective of NATO, but from the Russian perspective. Uh, Kievan Rus was once considered the heart of what is now called Russia before the center of power moved to Moscow in the 13th century. Uh, it's not only Russian power brokers who regard Ukraine and Belarus, which we could talk about later, as part of, part of larger Russia. Even Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he was in exile in Vermont in 1991, around the time Laurie was teaching international law, uh, argued that the Soviet Union should indeed be broken up but that Belarus and Ukraine should remain part of Russia. As for Crimea, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the, uh, the, the perspective from uh, former, former leader Khrushchev, uh, but its transfer, let's just say, in 1954 to Russia, uh, to the, the Rus to, from the Russian Federated States to Ukraine in 1954 was problematic, to say the least. Suffice it to say that many in Russia, and about a quarter of Ukrainians, and the vast majority of those who live in Crimea, identify all of Ukraine with Russia. Um, the very word Ukraine uh, comes from the Slavic word meaning border. And from the Russian perspective, NATO was butting up against that border and threatening to transgress it. None of this, of course, justifies Russia's actions. But in retrospect, it should have made President Putin's actions less surprising. So lastly, two takeaways. What, what do I at least take away from this? And this is really a provocation to conversation. First, taken seriously, what Russia is really articulating here is a vision of an international order premised on spheres of influence. President Putin in 2005 called the collapse of the Soviet Union one of the greatest geopolitical catastrophes of the 20th century, among other things because it left tens of millions of what he called our co-citizens and co-patriots outside of Russian territory. Uh, so this vision of international law, which provides for spheres of influence, uh, is something that's not unique to Russia. Indeed, you could make interesting comparisons with the way in which China is articulating maritime claims in, South China, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. A second takeaway is that for the United States in particular, uh, it should make it very clear what many of us, particularly many of us in the room, I think, have argued all along, that meretricious legal arguments that are, politi that are politically expedient can also be used by other states. Kosovo for example, could never be truly sui generis, and the Iraq war undermined the prohibition on the use of force. And as we look today at what the United States has is, been, is doing with drone technology and surveillance, something that at the moment only the United States can do effectively, and there are arguments that rules that apply to that should be limited to the United States, what Russia has been doing in Crimea and may do in Ukraine should give us pause. Thanks. You've kept very closely within your time. Maybe a little bit of border encroachment there, but <laughs> close. So uh, we turn now to Professor Kapusta. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> I um, would like to uh, thanks uh, thank, to thank uh, American uh, Society of International Law.
for invitation to take part in this meeting and uh, especially Lori Dambrov because <laughs> she could uh, she could uh, convict me to go there, to go here so I apologize, uh, apologize my English because it's not my everyday deal uh, so excuse me uh, I try to uh, uh, to explain uh, some uh, some ideas uh, about the topic and I took two of uh, questions. First of all, I uh, would like uh, to attract your attention to the key question in the understanding of the present situation in Ukraine. We can uh, have much fantasy uh, how to uh, use or no international law, but I think uh, that this uh, question is uh, crucial uh, for uh, good understanding of this situ situation. All other points, like the effect uh, effectiveness of UN security system, or the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of uh, unilateral uh, sanctions against Russia, etc., uh, continue to have the proper importance in, in international legal system. And uh, I think this uh, question uh, seems to be less um, significant in this uh, context. Well, after three months uh, of political struggle, which uh, costs about 100 human lives, there was uh, on 24 February a, va a violent uh, armed uh, capture of the state power in Ukraine, or anti uh, constitutional uh, coup d'etat, or so called Maidan Revolution. By the way, it was the second revolution in the last decade in this country. So what does mean the revolution from the international point of view or from international law uh, prospect? Nothing good for law, nothing. Uh, first of all, uh, the appearance of uh, the, gam the government, the legality or legitimacy is uh, political sciences, uh, of which is equal to zero. As a rule, the general international law requires from other states and uh, other subjects of international law uh, to refrain from uh, interference uh, in the internal affairs of the revolutionary state if the latter uh, conduction is in strong accordance with international law and particularly with international human rights law. But if the anti-constitutional government is demonstrating other kind of condition, for instance, violating human rights, or at least is not able to secure them in their territory, there will be emerging a new legal situation, I think. <clears throat> so the international organizations and organs, as well as other states, especially neighbor states of uh, such a, a revolutionary state, receive the right to monitor the internal situation and take appropriate uh, measures. I will not analyze the problem of recognition of the revolutionary government because I consider it is other side of the situation. And the question, uh, uh, I also uh, don't uh, talk about the division of the competence among neighbor states or any other state uh, concerning, uh, concerned and the corresponding international organization. It is extremely interesting question, but I can only affirm that the interest of any international organization to deal with the situation does not exclude the activity or actions taken by other state. Uh, uh, if UN Charter doesn't establish the other requ uh, requirements, if, of course, we uh, understand that uh, there are some um, very, um, very firm norms uh, of international conduction regulated by, uh, by UN Charter. I think it is uh, enough for beginning. So uh, by concluding uh, that question, <coughs> uh, I, uh, what are the main features of internal situation now in Ukraine? It creates uh, some worries for other states. My answer e is yes, it is. Why? I think there are some uh, characteristics uh, which create by worry. Total absence of rule of law because the power of um, existing government is not uh, based uh, under the authority uh, uh, conferred by law. Second, there is still going on political instability. 
Obviously, Ukraine descent into chaos and violence that affect not only their own population, but also the surrounding region. Economic and, and social instability, poverty and fair distribution of, territorial, uh, of material resources, and very huge level of corruption are the main futures of modern Ukraine. Lack of inter international security, uh, uh, of, excuse me, of internal security, uh, because from the February we say uh, how many armed uh, groups are traveling across the country, expropriating property of other people, terrorizing policy and prosecutor officers. Uh, this list is not exhaustive, but uh, we can uh, continue. It, but I think it's enough to affirm that the Ukraine now is not only a common concern of international community, but there is also reason to legal and well-founded uh, worry of its neighbors. <coughs> These circumstances uh, are given rise to appropriate reaction uh, of its neighbors, which have the right to act in extraordinary conditions. My second uh, the question is concerning the role, uh, the role of law, the role what uh, does international commitments to self-determination in evaluating uh, the lawfulness of the secession of Crimea and its reintegration. Uh, let me uh, use this term. We in Russia consider that uh, we not uh, annex this territory, we reintegrate, reintegrate in the wake of a popular referendum. I would like to say that both self-determination and the peoples uh, uh, will demonstrate in result of a popular referendum in Crimea are playing the decisive role in the proclamation of the independence and then in the decision of uh, um, reintegrate uh, with Russia. The principle of self-determination is included in the UN Charter and two human rights covenant as a common, uh, common article one. And that way was inserted into, in the, into the framework of modern international law. The basic principle has been uh, revealed in greater detail in a number of other international instruments. Uh, I, I, I will not uh, uh, list uh, all of this. And uh, proceeding from those instruments, the main elements of the right to self-determination, uh, includes a session, could be summarized as follows. First, each people has a right to self-determination. Second, this right is recognized by all the state, at least members of, of, of the UN and uh, of the Covenant. Third, it is not, be, not to be realized through free choice of, uh, by peoples or without any in, interference uh, from the outside. Four, it presumes that <coughs> there is a possibility to choose between the so-called internal determination, uh, for example, obtaining the status of subject of, <coughs> of the federation, autonomy, or other form of self-determination within an existing state, or cessation of a given peel, uh, uh, people involving the establishment of a new state, or cessation of a given people when it is admitted on certain condition, uh, con conditions as a part of another state. Thus, it premiums, uh, uh, presumes excuse me, a choice of political status, including the choice of form of state, etc. It includes also the right uh, to freely ensure the economic, social, and cultural development. At present, there are no international mechanism or uh, specific norm uh, of international law which could be used to determine whether a given people has the right to succession or which could regulate the relationship between a succession movement, um, a state, and third party. Nevertheless, uh, in accordance with the interpretation uh, uh, recognized uh, in UN practice and supported by among other documents, uh, the Declaration of 1970 and, and the Vienna Declaration and the Program of Action uh, of 1993, secession may be legitimated in uh, some cases. I uh, will not uh, list all of them. Uh, I uh, only, <coughs> only say, uh, uh, I, I only uh, attract attention to the uh, final. If the given people give, live in the territory of a state which does not conduct itself in compliance with the principle of equal right and self-determination of peoples, 
and which does not ensure representation of all its people in its government without the discrimination, these people can use uh, uh, this uh, right to self-determination uh, by their own, uh, own choice uh, and to, uh, to choose uh, the necessary uh, form of uh, uh, self-determination. I, I, I list them. So, consequently, concluding the analysis of the right to self-determination, we can assert that in the case of Crimea and Ukraine, it had played, played a decisive role in the justification of succession from Ukraine and reintegration with Russia. Thank you very much. Our third speaker will be Professor Khrushchova. Thank you very much. Um, Dick Cheney's lawyers were very meticulous in arguing as to why the United States needed to invade Iraq. So good for Vladimir Putin. He, he really uses that playbook most brilliantly. Um, I, as mentioned before, uh, know nothing about law. My most knowledge comes from Law and Order and Jack McCoy. Uh, so I will be uh, talking about politics and uh, how law is used as an instrument of politics. Um, and um, I teach propaganda in politics, so uh, I'm absolutely fascinated with the language of the Russian government today. I find it, I mean, George Orwell actually is just uh, so jealous of what's happening. They are coming out of the Kremlin. For example, I just learned that apparently uh, it is not an annexation of Crimea, it is reintegration, uh, which is an excellent uh, choice of words here. Um, so today we are uh, uh, confronted with, uh, with news from Kharkiv and, and Donetsk that uh, these countries are um, declaring themselves uh, uh, independent from Ukraine or trying to do so. Uh, and it does uh, go back to Vladimir Putin's annexation speech, or as we learned today, it is the reintegration speech of Crimea. So in that speech, as you may remember, he claimed that the Bolsheviks who attached part of Eastern Ukraine to, uh, to Ukraine uh, actually did so illegally uh, after the revolution of uh, 1917. I found also that um, a fascinating argument because if we start deconstructing history, uh, then uh, we can um, look at history of Donetsk, one of those parts of Eastern Ukraine that Vladimir Putin was talking about and much in the news today. Uh, Donetsk, uh, some of you may know, was originally called Yuzovka, and I don't know how many of you know why it was called Yuzovka. It was called that because uh, John Hughes, a Welsh uh, man, actually started that place uh, as a um, industrial and mining center. So I'm sure there's some relatives of, of uh, John Hughes who would like to reclaim that property uh, in that development somewhere in Great Britain. Uh, so that we can carry that argument uh, that very far. Uh, Kharkiv today is called a very Russian city. Uh, no, it was originally a Ukrainian city, although it was uh, very forcefully russified throughout throughout the years. Um, uh, I think uh, Professor Kapustin said really a uh, very important thing that revolutions are uh, not good often for law, indeed they're not. Uh, and if the Bolsheviks were illegal, and by that very logic, uh, Vladimir Putin claims that today Kyiv's transitional government is illegal, that's fine. But then what are we going to do with then the, conse uh, the, um, uh, the, the consequent uh, history of post-Bolshevik revolution. So 75 years, it was indeed sort of uh, an illegal government and all the things that have been done were illegal. But once again, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, a lot of uh, latest polls show that a lot of the population uh, define themselves as Soviets. So that is kind of a double, um, uh, double false, false statements right there and then. 1954, really had to apologize for my family members, uh, left and right. Not going to do it here, uh, but uh, do want to talk about the transfer of Crimea and go back to Vladimir Putin's reintegration Crimea speech. Once again, he says the decision was made with the inconsistencies even give, given the period constitution. So 1954, it was still uh, Joseph Stalin's constitution of 
1936 uh, that being used? What kind of inconsistencies? Uh, 1936 constitution was adopted just a year before the great purges of 1937. We do know that history and uh, basically all laws were very arbitrary then. So I don't really know what, what those inconsistencies are in Vladimir Putin's view, uh, and in fact, really citing legal matters in Russian or uh, uh, Soviet history generally is a very risky proposition because borders were uh, changed, moved around, um, you know, the Caucasus is a good example, Central Asia is a good example, Russia, there were regions that were uh, called one way, for example, there was Aryol region and then part of it became Kaluga region and whatnot. Uh, in 1956, the Karela Finnish Republic ceased to exist altogether. So this is, you know, when you cite from uh, basically uh, um, uh, legal issues in, in, in a place that doesn't recognize laws or use laws as politics, as I said, it is a quite a risky um, proposition. Uh, one more thing, uh, actually, according to the Constitution, the transfer was legal, and I do put it in quotes because what was legality in the Soviet Union is a very, uh, is a very good question because the idea was that uh, the territory could be transferred as both parties agreed, and both parties were the Russian Federation and, and the Ukrainian Republic in 1954. Of course, all parties agreed because the Kremlin told them so. There is no such thing as a referendum. Uh, or uh, any questions to the public, because the public was supposed to do what the Kremlin says, says it does. Um, there is one actually interesting claim today in Crimea. It is the truthful claim, so to speak, because um, as you remember, 1991, Boris Yeltsin declared self-determination to all of the um, former Soviet uh, former Soviet spaces, and Crimea adopted its own constitution in 1992, was supposed to be an independent state with three state languages, uh, Crimean Tatar, uh, Russian, and Ukrainian, but in 95, uh, Ukrainian parliament actually annulled that uh, constitution and made uh, Crimea uh, officially became an independent, I mean autonomous, not independent, sorry, autonomous republic that would follow 1996. <laughs> Ukrainian constitution that will happen under uh, President Leonid Kuchma. So in this case, one could argue that if the new Kiev government is a result of a coup, <coughs> then uh, Crimea automatically sort of returns to the constitution of 1992, maybe from a legal standpoint, but um, uh, still even the annexation or as we now know, reintegration uh, by Russia is not a legal matter here because it is a political a political matter, and I respectfully disagree with Professor Kapustin here. Um, so once again, Putin's justification, from my point of view, remains false because it was political rather than <laughs> legal, although they may uh, argue legal. So I would like to conclude with uh, Russia's other examples. For example, uh, you know, sort of the law a la carte that that uh, in politics, uh, kind of in po political jargon, is being is being used. Uh, for example, Chechnya, as, as you know, was a big story uh, for a long, long time. Fought for, its, for independence in the 90s and the 2000s, <coughs> uh, in the early 2000s. But of course, uh, it was argued that Russian Federation territorial integrity comes first, and therefore Chechnya could not become independent, cannot, uh, uh, cannot secede. Yet in Crimea, then suddenly it is self-determination, once again, a la carte law. Uh, references to Kosovo, and I think that was already mentioned, but just sort of from my perspective, of course, false because um, uh, if we go back to, to that conversation, then it was the Tatars, the Crimean Tatars, that should be those who claim independence in, in Crimea as they were the original. Um, as they were the original to, to that area. I mean, as I said, Kharkiv was Ukrainian in 1600s. I mean, you know, whatever Russians did afterwards still shouldn't be then, then an issue here. So um, my final point is that um, um, when, when uh, Russians are, or the Kremlin argues that, uh, you know, Russian, Russian rights are being, um, are being so, so abused is actually what we're seeing, and I talk to a lot of people in, in Kyiv and Crimea, in fact, uh, they're, uh, they're Ukrainians that are being abused, they're Ukrainians that are being killed, 
uh, contrary to what the Kremlin propaganda says, that is, the um, Russian rights, uh, Russian rights are prosecuted. Um, so, just to final point, law used as politics ce uh, cease to exist as uh, law internationally or domestically. Thank you. So, finally, uh, we turn to Peter Olson. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, don't purport to speak for NATO. I no longer work for NATO, um, and I'm obviously not authorized uh, to do so. Nonetheless, the questions that I'll uh, speak to in my introductory comments are, are ones that I think are of particular relevance uh, to the alliance. Um, let me begin, though, by saying that this situation is not merely uh, part of a larger NATO-Russia rivalry. Um, views can differ on the wisdom uh, of NATO policies since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, although I think recent events make it pretty clear why certain nations, particularly close to Russia's borders, might have wanted to be part of NATO. But nothing that NATO has done or is alleged to have done can excuse, explain, or justify Russia's threat and use of force against Ukraine, its violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity and political independence, the staging of a sham referendum in Crimea, or the unilateral annexation of Ukrainian territory. I think this may help us with um, one of the convener's questions, how are we to evaluate Putin's references to Iraq, Libya, and Kosovo? Um, I don't think those references, or at least in two-thirds of the cases, make a whole lot of sense legally because the Russian case has, I think, settled down to being one based on self-defense, or rather uh, self-determination, um, rather and that the, on the premise that there has been no Russian use of force at all. It was uh, local self-defense units who had visited military surplus stores recently. Um, but I think um, it, it can be evaluated um, as an attempt to change the subject. It can also be evaluated as an attempt to create uh, moral ambiguity about a situation which is not really that ambiguous. Uh, I think it is all these references are also intended to uh, convey the um, rather uh, uh, unpleasant message that uh, this is the way of the world. This is how the big guys behave, and if you don't like it, um, too bad. That's the way it works. As I say, that's not very pretty, but one can understand the political attractions of, of making uh, that, that case. Um, because I think there isn't really much to say in terms of self-defense, of self-determination in the cases of of Iraq and Libya, I won't uh, say too much about them. Um, it's clear that the, uh, uh, the intervention in Iraq um, was one which is legally problematic. Um, the U.S. Uh, and, and those other nations that participated with it made a legal case, um, and I think their action was built on, a, on shared and real concerns about uh, the presence of WMD uh, against uh, binding uh, Security Council resolutions. Um, but I think it is worth noting that uh, in that case, as, as uh, Professor Chesterman noted, um, there was no issue of annexation. Basra is not now the 51st U.S. state, and Iraq is clearly uh, fully sovereign in a way that the short-lived Crimean Republic never will be. Um, case of Libya also not a matter of self-determination. Russia, Russia has long alleged that NATO's actions uh, went well beyond the relevant uh, Security Council resolution, um, and I think uh, President Putin's speech is interesting in that regard because he refers to the no-fly zone but does not refer to the fact that the mandate, and the most important mandate, was to protect, take, make all, take all necessary measures to protect Libyan civilians against attack, including the attack that was then in uh, in contemplation uh, on the city of Benghazi. That's what NATO did, and its actions were consistent with the 
uh, UN Charter and Security Council resolutions. I think the most interesting of the three cases referred to is Kosovo because that actually is a case of self-determination and in fact uh, as I read uh, Putin's speech he does not it is self-determination only uh, with in, that he discusses in the context of, of Kosovo. I think there's one key difference between the two situations which is that unlike in Kosovo the Crimean act of supposed self-determination occurred in the context of an illegal use of force and intimidation by Russian forces that had ousted the Ukrainian authorities. But there were other essential differences as well. Um, others in this audience know better than I, and we don't have time to discuss them, but there was a history of oppression, um, a history of atrocities, a history of expulsions of the local population. You have only to look at the preamble to Resolution 1244 to see how bad the situation was. Um, nothing like that was the case in Crimea. Uh, there were legal differences as well. Our Security Council Resolution 1244 had removed fra the uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia from the exercise of sovereignty and provided for creation of institutions of, of self-government. The political situation was different. This, there was a status process, a lengthy status process that was carried out in accordance with Security Council Resolution. And the Declaration of Independence was taken by freely elected representatives who clearly reflected the popular wishes of the uh, great majority of the Kosovo people. But I think the most important and interesting aspect of these three cases uh, of supposed Western unilateralism is that they were all, in fact, deeply embedded in the UN system. The Libyan measures implemented a Security Council resolution. Kosovo also implemented a Security Council re resolution and involved a decade of UN administration and years of attempts to resolve the final status puzzle within a UN context. Even Iraq followed the 91 war, and, but also a 2002 Security Council resolution relating to weapons of mass destruction. Nothing of this sort took place or is taking place with respect to Crimea or eastern Ukraine. There's been no Russian effort that I'm aware of to raise the issue of Ukrainian oppression of Russian speakers uh, in the Security Council or to gain Security Council action. Now this brings us back briefly to the first question does Crimea show that the UN Charter's collective security system is powerless against a, term, a determined P5 member? If by the collective security system we mean coercive enforcement actions involving the use of force or threat thereof, I agree with Professor Chesterman. The answer is clearly yes. And for the reasons that he cited, the principal enforcement organ of the Charter of the UN is the Security Council, and its design includes a P5 veto. Just as in 1945, the building blocks of the international system are sovereign states, is still sovereign states, and especially the big ones. Well, we may not particularly like it, but that is the way the way the charter was designed. The answer may be not quite so clear if you read the collective security system a bit more broadly. Uh, first, of course, the charter envisages explicitly roles for regional organizations, which I would note NATO is not one of. Um, but it's also fully consistent with the Charter for states to organize among themselves for effective self-defense. That's what NATO did, and uh, indeed it was effective for 50 years. Um, NATO is continuing to act in self-defense of, <coughs> of its members defensively and prudently in response to the actions in Ukraine. Moreover, the international system has developed since 1945, and there are other forms of enforcement and fora for deciding on them. Um, however effective or ineffective they may be, economic sanctions, political sanctions have been agreed by the EU and others. The UN General Assembly has called on international organizations not to recognize the annexation of Crimea, and I think that will be uh, a very interesting thing to watch uh, in coming months. Uh, these sanctions may not have uh, an immediate definitive effect, but they will have some bite, more bite, if they are intensified. So it may be a little early to say that the whole system has failed and showed itself to be powerless. A couple concluding comments. Um, the Russian actions in uh, Ukraine attack three core elements of the post-war international legal order. Uh, territorial integrity and political independence. This is the first and the most expressed commitment in the UN Charter, and it's been repeated many times in many contexts by all UN members. It builds on the core concept of traditional public international law, the centrality of the sovereign state. 
The Russian actions make a mockery of human rights and particularly of self-determination, a pillar that's developed over the past 70 years and is viewed by many as now a co-equally central element of public international law. And third, it attacks critical procedural norms, in particular that the UN and the Security Council are where such issues are to be raised and debated. Russia isn't the first bad actor or the first state to ignore core elements of the Charter and international law since 1945, but it may be the first, one of them anyway, to treat the UN as literally irrelevant to its actions. The Russian actions are also especially striking, I think, in the European context because the elements I just referred to, and in particular territorial integrity and human rights, have both been accepted as normative in post-war Europe, I think, to a greater degree than anywhere else in the world. And thus, the Russian actions in Ukraine constitute a fundamental attack on the underpinnings of European peace and security as they've existed since 1945. There is, I think, an understandable unease about accepting uh, that these actions have those implications. Uh, many of us, I think, would like to think that we've moved beyond having to rely on historical relics, such as NATO, but I think many Europeans today are very happy that NATO is still there. Thanks. I want to uh, thank all the speakers for abiding by the time limit. So we do have a short amount of time for interchange among the panelists up here at the table, and then uh, very shortly we will turn to all of you for your questions. So how to organize this discussion? Professor Chesterman is ready to go. Sure. So I've got, I've got maybe a question for Professor Kavustin, um, which concerns, the, I think it was the fourth of your principles of self-determination, which would allow any community, you didn't define how large or small a community, um, to choose between autonomy or potentially full independence. And I'm conscious as I walked in here, you, you walk past one of these tickers that says the amount of money that DC, District of Columbia residents have paid without adequate representation in the US government. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm conscious that there might be DC residents who would be interested in this. Um, but are you seriously suggesting that any community anywhere can unilaterally determine that they should be independent and that the rest of the world should accept that in general? And that in particular, in Crimea, they could ignore the clear provisions of the Ukrainian constitution, which provided for modifications to territory if all of Ukraine voted in, in such a referendum. Okay, okay. Um, and secondly, that in the Crimean referendum, such as it was, there was no option to maintain the status quo. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, I want to say that, uh, of course, when I uh, say that uh, each, not each community, I use other word, each people. I know that in international law, uh, literature and science, uh, there are a lot of uh, big, huge uh, discussion, which is people, is people or nation and so on. Uh, uh, I don't um, uh, come in some details now. I uh, want to say that, uh, you know, uh, in literature also I, uh, uh, I read uh, one, uh, one thesis, one uh, uh, affirmation that each community has the right to the self-determination, but not each community has the right to secession, because the forms of, uh, uh, in, in this very, very broad sense of self-determination, each community has. Uh, one district of Washington, uh, uh, D.C., for instance, want to, uh, to live uh, or to, uh, in, in, in many, many, uh, how to say, little houses, other like big houses, so on. It's possible to do. It's possible, uh, uh, the form of this, uh, self determination. Second, secondly, about the uh, uh, um, concrete situation in Crimea. I think it's very simply, uh, it's, 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 it's impossible uh, to um, uh, simplify this situation. The problem is, it's imp uh, you, you know, first of all, it's impossible to uh, invoke now to the constitution of Ukraine. What constitution now is valid in, in Ukraine? Who uh, uh, can may, uh, say, say, 
I don't know exactly. The, situ the legal situation there is very unclear. It's first. The second. The problem is uh, the, that I think uh, uh, each of Ukrainian constitution from 1992 to 1996 and uh, 2004 and others, 2010, all of them are. Uh, um, uh, are uh, um, uh, presumed or have uh, disposition or have uh, provision that uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine is a unitarian state with uh, such regions and one autonomous republic. Why? Uh, unitarian state has autonom uh, autonomous republic. It's it's not it's not uh, it's, it's not uh, how to say it's not um, it's not so uh, okay my English uh, my my knowledge uh, uh, not uh, improved my knowledge uh, um, now uh, okay I, I can say so that the problem is uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, central Ukrainian government. Uh, uh, have uh, had to include this provision in the Constitution uh, to uh, stress the special status of this territory. Because from the 1991, Crimean people uh, voted uh, in some uh, referendums, more than uh, three or four, uh, I don't remember now how much, uh, maybe five, and they all, all, always uh, proclaimed their independence in their, uh, in their uh, independence on this territory. And uh, they proposed to Ukraine uh, to join, you know, not to include by central uh, government, but uh, uh, and to propose to uh, conclude some treaty between, some uh, contract between uh, Ukraine and Crimea. So the legal situation is not so simple as, as, as you uh, can explain us. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, uh, when we say about uh, the, mm, I, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to add to my uh, conclusion one more uh, idea. When you say that uh, the, the uh, mm, Simon, you, <laughs> excuse me if I, uh, um, a, a little emotionally say, I, I like your argumentation, I respect you, but, uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> but uh, I don't agree with uh, all of your um, uh, thoughts, you know. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, uh, if we say about the um, effectiveness or no of UN security system, I think it's quite effective especially in this case too. Why? I think that uh, in this case, in this case, uh, when we say about uh, self-determination and not, uh, I, I don't uh, now um, explain other, uh, other aspects of this uh, um, action of uh, how you say Russian uh, action uh, in, in Crimea on, uh, on in Ukraine. I think it's quite effective, uh, the system, because, because the question of um, self-determination is not under uh, UN Security uh, Council competence. I don't know any article of UN Charter where uh, uh, offer uh, Security Council to, dis, uh, to, uh, to, resolve, uh, to resolve about these questions. Uh, the problem was other. The problem was that uh, 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 thanks to this situation in Kiev, it was a real, a real threat to, uh, to two million people, at least. They afraid that some uh, uh, this partisan or uh, uh, fighters from uh, Maidan, uh, they uh, promised to, to, to send in Crimea some train of, uh, uh, how it calls, train, uh, friendship train, to kill uh, 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 that people who are no, uh, not uh, agree with uh, the central uh, government. It's a real threat to people, to life. And so if uh, in this uh, case, uh, I think, the Security uh, Council uh, 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 
Your security system does not look as good for that, that people who is not killed. It's good, it's not bad. Because uh, international law, like UN law, too, like UN system, is for men uh, and for people, I think, not for uh, any formal uh, reasons uh, or arguments, legal arguments or other one. I think it's good that there is no, only two people were killed during the demonstration in, in Crimea, two. Not million, not, not, not uh, thousands. Well, I think we could uh, ask you many other questions. I wanted to follow up on, I think, uh, one of the implications of Professor Chesterman's uh, question to you, which would be, uh, it was the Russian Federation itself prepared to live by a rule under which members of uh, the autonomous republics within the Russian Federation or members of ethnic groups within the Russian Federation could decide that this is their moment to take their referendum and take their decision to exit from uh, the Russian Federation. And that uh, seems to be the logical follow-on, not confined yeah. to Crimea, yeah. but more broadly to the uh, makeup of uh, the Russian Federation. Yes, um, 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 I understand uh, your question, but I, uh, I would like to add uh, to all my previous um, uh, ideas. Uh, I think that the right to autonomous regions or autonomous republic to self-determination was recognized by very authoritative organ, international organ. Uh, the, um, uh, but the Intercommission, analyzing the situation in former Yugoslavia, said that autonomous republic, uh, uh, when they uh, um, uh, describe the situation, analyzing the situation in Kosovo, the autonomous republic of uh, uh, former uh, Yugoslavia has the right to self-determination and not and others uh, territorial uh, uh, units has not, it's the opinion of so authoritative uh, commission, and I agree with it. Which, uh, when we say uh, about Russia, about Chechnya, etc., uh, uh, Nina also said about Chechnya, it's not so, so easy question, uh, of course, for Russia, and we, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessary to understand us. I'm not, uh, first of all, I'm not a son advocate of, uh, of my government. I, I only uh, scientist, you know, I have my, my proper opinion and sometimes I agree, sometimes no. But the question of Crimea is uh, how to say, it's not um, only um, person question or public question, it's person for, for many Russians, it's necessary uh, to understand us. But uh, what, when we say about uh, Chechnya, for instance, Chechnya, yes, uh, you should know that if I remember well, from 1990, 1994 to 1997, before two uh, Chechnya was, Russia de facto recognized their independence. We has not uh, there any effective power because uh, Dudaev and his um, government uh, uh, had all power, held all uh, uh, effective functions in the territory. And only, and we uh, prepared to officially recognize the independence. When the troops of uh, Chechnya uh, came into uh, Dagestan, so we uh, receive, we understand that it's impossible uh, to live in, in, in peaceful conditions there. And we decided to restore the constitutional order and to restore federal uh, government there but we, we were uh, ready. According to our constitution, if we say about other autonomous, um, uh, autonomous republic, yes, uh, our constitution in the preamble, and uh, it, uh, it um, stress uh, that Russian people uh, respect the right and Russian uh, of other uh, people, uh, the right to, to self-determination, but uh, uh, in, uh, Comparing with Soviet constitution, we has not uh, recognized the right to secession. Not only autonomous republic, but a republic <laughs> <laughs> and, other, and other territorial uh, uh, units uh, at all. Thank you. Thanks. I, I want to also give uh, Professor Khrushcheva mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Olson the opportunity to ask a question or make an observation on the other presentations, and then we will turn to the audience for your questions and comments. 
Well, I just actually have uh, not even a question, but a comment, and maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, you said that uh, uh, Russia threatens, uh, treat it, treats UN as, as irrelevant, and that is a very big danger to the international community. Not that I disagree with you, I do agree, but uh, I think from the Russian point of view, and I love the fact that I'm arguing the Russian point of view here, <laughs> uh, but here I am, is that uh, it, uh, there was a belief that uh, Ambassador Bolton, when he was ambassador to the United Nations, did treat UN as irrelevant and in fact created a certain precedent for other, uh, for other countries to maybe treat the UN as, ir as irrelevant, and I'm sure that is very big, probably 90% of Putin's mind. So I wonder if you could comment on that, because it is uh, not, I mean, I can argue politically, but I would like you to respond to this as, as a legal scholar. As a legal scholar, there's a standard for you. I'm not sure I can <laughs> meet it. Um, right now, um, I am in the process of adjusting to being a private citizen. Um, which, which makes it very interesting to answer questions like that. Um, I think every nation, um, every state, uh, has some of its less proud moments. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the fact, um, I mean, I, I was never a great fan of John Bolton, to say the least. Um, and I don't think uh, that uh, his tenure at the UN um, uh, did any good for the United States or for, or the rule of law. Um, I don't think, however, the fact that um, a particular ambassador in a particular administration may have been viewed as not uh, having immense respect for the UN means that uh, it therefore means the United States can never have a view. Uh, uh, on UN matters or can never respect the UN or can never uh, expect others to do so. Um, and I think if one looks at, at the US record, generally speaking, it is one in which there has been a considerable respect for the UN. Um, the point I think I was making, um, however, was uh, that it was even, even with John Bolton, um, the, U the US um, took the UN seriously. I mean, it addressed the issues in the UN context. Um, and that, that was the, the contrast I was making here is that this issue, um, which is one which uh, clearly led the Russian Federation, or at least its president, to feel that it was necessary to use force against, uh, against the norms of respect for territorial integrity, um, which had been so fundamental in Europe, um, was not one that uh, he apparently thought were serious enough or appropriate to raise to the UN at all. Uh, and I think that really is a, a frankly, a fairly shocking development. Mm -hmm. Yes, you may, you may. I just wanted to just alert the audience now that we are now going to move into the segment where we receive your questions. And so uh, we're going to have a couple of uh, standing microphones there if people want to proceed to the microphone while we give uh, Professor Kapustin the floor to respond to Mr. Olson's comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ol Olson. I, uh, I understand what uh, Louis Minowen saying that uh, to resort to the force, it's, it's not good for uh, UN Charter. I agree with you. But uh, all depend on the concrete situation. I think uh, uh, if you read uh, Putin's uh, speech very carefully, you, uh, I understand that Putin uh, tried, to, tried to explain uh, their position, tried to support, uh, etc. But uh, I think it's impossible to say that it was uh, um, use of force uh, against uh, uh, territorial integrity in, uh, Ukraine, of Ukraine. Why? First of all, uh, the Russian troops don't pass, uh, didn't pass uh, the Ukrainian border. 
we use force. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, our, uh, if I understand uh, well, uh, uh, some of our units uh, uh, which uh, situated in, in this uh, uh, Crimea military base, uh, they uh, take uh, some part in, in the, uh, um, how to say, um, securing uh, uh, these units of Ukrainian army, uh, and we uh, also uh, try to uh, help to um, local um, uh, outer defense uh, forces to uh, prevent uh, some, um, some uh, groups uh, of armed people from Kiev by uh, in, 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 air, uh, in uh, two aerodromes uh, when they try to to, to take them, this, but no one was killed. No, it was. It is not uh, the uh, the uh, intent to, to take uh, other territory. Uh, it it was not any uh, uh, was at uh, that time, uh, time again or about referendum or other thing. The second, uh, uh, I think, is very important, uh, very important uh, thing that um, when we uh, say about using of force, uh, I would like to remind that at that time, when Russian, uh, very, very uh, um, limited uh, Russian uh, military group tried to stop uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, units. I think that they do not, uh, Ukrainian, uh, which are Ukrainian militaries which are in, in the Crimea territory, they don't want to, in, in, to be involved in this uh, internal strike. It's, it's clear, but they received, it's now, it's published. I don't know if uh, in, in Europe uh, is this or no. I don't know, I, it's, it's no my question. But it's published. Uh, the order of the so-called uh, new president to use arm against civilian people. So they they refused the sold, Ukrainian soldiers to refused to to uh, um, uh, to fulfill this order. But it was it, it's clear criminal order. It is. Uh, the the uh, uh, mean of the of auto defense all like this it's it's impossible i think uh, uh, russia use uh, of course if we say uh, that is it, it it is not with uh, un charter to use force against uh, other state sorry if i remember well we uh, discuss it, it in this discussion also uh, there is also in united nations about the conception so called conception of uh, r2p responsibility to protect in some situation it's i think it's very very uh, exclusive situation but in some situation when un system does not work when uh, the, uh, there is no any uh, mm, uh, agreement and understanding between uh, big powers, some powers can use force to protect civilian uh, population in very, very uh, little uh, ways to use uh, uh, military force uh, for this purpose. Why we say that it's good and uh, the use of Russian people to, to help uh, civilians is bad? Is bad, is bad uh, action or is bad uh, use of force? I don't think so. It's good because it's for, uh, for people, for, uh, for civilian people, not for, uh, uh, to take uh, territory or, or like this. It, in, at that time, there was not uh, such an intent, if I know. Well, I'm, I'm motivated to make many comments myself, but I see that there are uh, speakers at the microphone, and so let's take your questions, uh, please. My name is Mary Ellen O'Connell. I'm a professor of international law at the University of Notre Dame. And this is a question very brief for Simon. Um, I mean, there's so many interesting things we could take up from the many interesting comments. But my focus is particularly on upholding the rule of law, um, in particular the prohibition on the use of force in Article 2, Paragraph 4. And this is the, the, the clearest and most problematic aspect, of course, of, of what has happened with Crimea. And there is no good defense, as my uh, 
studies and, and, and research have done, despite the many interesting claims put forward by um, Professor Kasputin and, um, and Mr. Putin. But Simon, you said that we're just going to move on from Crimea and hope that there is no further action with the rest of Ukraine. Are we not, as an international community, going to treat the annexation as unlawful? It may be a de facto uh, annexation, but it's not de jure. And we've been able to uh, resist the recognition and absorption of northern Cyprus I into independence or to part of Turkey. Since 1974, that has not been recognized. So why is there not a uniform and strong uh, understanding throughout the international community that this annexation should not become a de jure matter? Yes. Um, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but the reason is it's not worth it. That appears to be the, that appears to be the political calculation that was made with respect to South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and Russia is not Turkey. Um, and so Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, you do have a UN operation, it's been there for, what, 40 years or something now. Um, and every couple of years, there's an effort to push ahead with some kind of solution. There may, may yet be a solution in Cyprus. Um, but uh, Turkey's, I think Turkey remains the only country, there might be one or, one or two others that recognize the trunk the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, but there are very, very few others. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not making a value judgment on the annexation of Crimea, but there seems to be no appetite uh, for standing up against what Russia has done. Um, just while I'm speaking, one of, part of the reason for this and why I think it, it's interesting, this discussion about Russia's attitude towards the UN, my own assessment, and I defer to my Russian colleagues who understand the situation much better than I do, is that the reason that President Putin wouldn't have taken an issue like Crimea to the UN is he doesn't regard it as an international issue. He regards it as part of the near abroad, part of greater Russia. I, I just uh, I, I want to go back to uh, Professor O'Connell's point because I think it's pretty um, fundamental and uh, relevant to our theme here of effectiveness of international law because uh, what I hear uh, Professor Chesterman is saying is that, well, everybody's going to shrug their shoulders and not do anything about it. And I think uh, Professor O'Connell is uh, rallying us to say, well, the minimum uh, collective statement that has to be made is not to recognize that the absorption of Crimea into the Russian Federation is uh, lawful. And so to treat it in the same way that the uh, so-called uh, declaration of the Turkish state of northern Cyprus has been treated as unlawful or to treat it in the same way as uh, violations of um, the fundamental norms of the charter have been stigmatized in the past. And uh, you know, we've got, I think, um, pretty good international law for the proposition that there's uh, not to be recognition of any territorial acquisition uh, purportedly worked by the use of force and so forth. So I step out of my moderator's role if I say that, but, you know, put a question mark after it or something, and uh, I think, you know, we should uh, have at least some discussion on those themes. Sorry, maybe just one sentence to be clear. De jure, I completely agree. De facto, I'm not optimistic. Hi, I'm Alan Gerson, AG International Law. Uh, we are speaking about the effectiveness of international law, and I think we can agree that the effectiveness of international law has to be a function as to whether or not we are looking at the law narrowly or whether we are looking at it in political context. I recall from Henry Kissinger's memoirs that when he went to Hanoi to try to get a peace deal, he said, yes, international law could be argued on both sides, but the truth is we were both the victims of misconception. On the U.S. side, we thought that the war was directed by Beijing and Moscow and not out of the North. So today, I feel compelled to say something because some of the arguments that I've heard are really rather legalistic, especially if I may say so by Mr. Olson, which fail to take account of the political context, and I invite a comment. Uh, I am certainly not here to say anything on, on behalf of Russia's actions in Crimea, but it does strike me, if we're talking about effectiveness, that we may want to look and provocation and context and how Russia might have been inclined to view the U.S. politicization of international law. So if you take the case of Kosovo, it's fine to say all sorts of things, 
But the truth remains that because Russia has the veto power at the UN, uh, we hardly asked for UN Security Council authorization in one way or another by arguing that it was implicit, whatever that means. The truth is there was no explicit authorization. But more importantly, in terms of the current grievance, as I understand it, uh, is the, uh, the issue of NATO and Libya. Uh, the truth, as I see it, is that the United States convinced Russia not to, uh, to veto a resolution which authorized the use of force for humanitarian purposes against the cities, citizens of Benghazi, who we said were facing a bloodbath. But then NATO used that resolution in order to bomb uh, Gaddafi as he was trying to leave uh, Libya when there was no longer any humanitarian threat. And it's clear, as, as Russia's foreign minister has said many times, uh, that they have considered this a betrayal of uh, the assurances that were given to them. Now, does one sense of betrayal lead to something else? No, I don't know that it does. But I think it is important to look at things in their full context and not simply to make uh, you know, lawyers' briefs that we might, in isolation, do before a court. Thank you. Well, an, an interesting comment. Um, and there are always lots of uh, stories, anecdotes um, about how uh, Security Council resolutions or other uh, arrangements are arrived at. Um, and there's no way to uh, prove them, generally speaking. I have uh, no personal basis for knowing um, uh, in particular what the United States may have promised to Russia in order to induce it to agree to the language it actually agreed to. Um, you know, so this is speculation as far as I'm concerned. I have uh, no reason to think, uh, you know, if the resolution was aimed only to deal with Benghazi, um, it seems an awful lot broader than that to me. Um, and I also have no reason to think that it was a uh, known fact that Gaddafi's departure from uh, his hideout in the last couple of days was solely for the purpose of uh, leaving the country. I know that until very, very shortly before, um, he was continuing to make threats against the population and was and throughout the period, not simply after the attack on Benghazi was, was turned back, um, that he was using uh, the regime forces to attack um, uh, Libyan civilians quite consistently over a period of, of several months. One may wonder why he did that. I mean, it doesn't seem, frankly, terribly bright um, to have, have done so given you know, once there was the, the engagement of, of the international community in the form of, of NATO. But that doesn't change the fact that he did continue those attacks. Um, and uh, I think those who, who remember uh, the period of that campaign will know that for, for many months um, there were attacks on Misrata um, and uh, other cities held by, by those opposed to the regime, um, which were pretty indiscriminate. Um, so you know, you've asserted certain things as facts. They may be because anything could be true, but they don't correspond to anything uh, I'm aware of. Um, you refer also, and it's, it's a curious uh, term to use in the context of a panel at the American Society of International Law, you referred to some of my points as legalistic arguments. Um, and a badge of honor. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of thought that was appropriate here. Um, <laughs> um, All right, we'll, we'll, we'll let it rest at that. And now I need to find out from our annual meeting co-chairs whether we, ha we, we do have to end now or we can't, we can't take the last two. Uh, OK. It seems that the next the one sentence each. And I'm sorry to the uh, two questioners who are at the microphone. One sentence. OK, one sentence, two phrases. Um, in, so my bottom line on this, in theory, of course, 
uh, well, it, this is a clear violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4. But the problem in practice is that Russia has used arguments like this before in South Ossetia and Abkhazia and got away with it. And the moral authority of the United States to condemn this action, unfortunately, has been undermined by Kosovo and Iraq. One sentence. Uh, I think um, uh, we um, discuss uh, some, uh, or um, uh, we express, uh, my colleagues express uh, some ideas about uh, this. Um, Precedents uh, which uh, President Putin uh, used in, in their uh, speech. I think it was only one. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, I. I want to. Um, how say to, uh, to explain only. I think uh, there is no um, direct parallels between this situation. He only, as I understand him, he only wants to um, uh, to say, wants to express that uh, we uh, live in very, very turbulent uh, world, in very dynamic one. And sometimes some other state, not only Russia, violate international law or not violate, try to no, uh, not uh, uh, um, uh, act in accordance, in, 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 in firm accordance with uh, some international law uh, uh, norms and uh, obligations. is not good, but sometimes it's not bad. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you have uh, one sentence concluded? Just one sentence. Uh, Putin may treat uh, Crimea, the Crimea issue is, uh, is a regional issue, not international, but it is an international issue because Ukraine is an independent country. Also, I don't think that there is motivation so much as to, I mean, yes, uh, um, biting out the former Soviet territories may be part of the motivation, but one of it is rivalry with the United States because Putin does feel very much, uh, uh, very much abused by the American hubris as he sees it, and not that America does not have hubris, by the way. Uh, there is an expression in Russian, uh, what a lion can do, the dog cannot. So in Crimea, Putin did show that I am not your dog. I am a lion too. Last word, Peter. Um, this really isn't a question of uh, U.S. moral authority to speak. As I said, every nation has its, has its, the, its problems. Um, but I think really of the international community's response and our response uh, as lawyers to violations of fundamental norms of the uh, post-war international legal order. Um, and I don't, I think it's, it's easy, but I think not a good thing for us to get caught up in uh, what uh, Professor uh, Chesterman calls two quoque arguments, uh, rather than looking at what has actually happened here. The, what has happened in Crimea is, I think, a very, very dangerous thing. Well, we could continue the discussion, but a very interesting event will follow immediately. So please join me in thanking the speakers. And please.